this graph that you see here is equal to one half. And I'm going to prove it to you. It doesn't just represent the number one half, it's equal to it. This is a random number system that is completely independent of everything that you've heard about before. Probably, unless you've heard about this specifically. And today we're going to talk about some simple examples to build up to some really weird and unintuitive ones that I find fascinating. So, the point of this presentation is to uh, inspire curiosity about um, this field of mathematics called combinatorial game theory, and also uh, to help challenge our perspective on what numbers are. Because a lot of us have preconceptions on what they are, and I'm here to challenge them a little bit. So uh, the illustrations that are in this presentation come from a video that I'll reference at the end. And with that, we'll begin. So we'll look at this combinatorial game theory through the lens of a game called Hack and Bush. This is one such position where you start with a tree, and a left and a right player represented with blue and red here. And as they, they take turns, they cut segments of their own color. And any, as you can see here, any time that there are segments left hanging, they also fall and are deleted. So they come out of play. Play continues until there are no line segments left. And whoever took the last turn wins because the other player does not have any valid move. So uh, now that we've established what the game is, uh, we'll talk about a little bit about the units used to describe these positions. The units of left, or blue in this, uh, in this case, are described as units of one, because it's one move in favor of the blue player. Likewise, the red position, or one of a red line segment like this, is described as negative one, because it's one move against blue. So without loss of generality, we're looking at things from blue's perspective, just arbitrarily. So uh, using this system, we can create any positive or negative integer. Uh, we can stack them up or lay them adjacent, it doesn't matter. Uh, another special case we need to look at real quickly is the empty game, in which clearly the first person to move loses because there is no valid move. So this is called a zero game, which is defined as being a situation where the first player to move loses, or equivalently the second player to move wins. Uh, so the second player here wins by default because they didn't lose. So. This is another example of a zero position, which you can see because no matter who moves first, the other player copies their move with their own color and wins because the first player doesn't have any more valid moves. So uh, this is the hack and push equivalent of adding one plus negative one, which is zero. So now, now we're back to this tree that we started everything with. I made the claim that this has a value of one half. We'll, we'll prove that now. We're prepared to, to talk about this better. So we'll call the value of this tree x. Uh, actually, real quick. First off, it's obvious that this has that this is in favor of the left player, blue. Because if red goes first, they take the top branch, and then blue moves, and they take down the rest of the tree. Red has no move, so blue wins. If blue goes first, they take down the whole tree, and red has no move, and blue wins. So this is called a positive game, because blue always wins, no matter who goes first. So we'll double this tree and try to balance it out with a negative one to find the value of x. So now we'll go through some gameplay scenarios and we'll assume for, for, the, for, for starters that blue goes first. Blue chops down one of the trees, it doesn't matter, go the same. Uh, red wants to save their, their free move here and so they take down the one that's on top of blue's. Blue takes that move and red takes that one Red wins because they had the last valid move. So blue going first meant that blue lost. Now, starting over, we'll assume that red moves first. Red takes off the top of one of the, the trees, again, leaving this one for later, because that's advantageous. Uh, blue takes that one because it's the contested tree. Uh, red takes that one, blue takes that one. And again, red going first meant that red lost. This fits the definition of a zero game. So we know that the value of this is zero. So x plus x plus, well, minus one equals zero. Therefore, obviously, x equals one half. This tree is equal to one half. 
And by a similar argument, you can show that this tree is equal to one quarter. You can do it again by uh, doubling it and balancing it out with a negative one half and show that this is a zero gain. Uh, notice that this is the same as the, the one half tree that we had before, but with the colors reversed, with red switched for blue and blue switched for red. So uh, you can prove that this is a zero gain, and we'll go into that right now. Using the same process, uh, you can create any dyadic rational from which you can generate any real number. So now we'll talk about the notation that's used to describe uh, positions like this. Um, so for any given number x, it has a set L and a set R, where L is the set of all moves that are valid for the left player, and R is the set of all moves valid for the right player. Uh, so let's go through some examples. Here is the number 0. It's empty on both sides because they're in the basic 0 game. There are no valid moves for any player. Uh, this is another example of a 0 game because, oh, you can see this from the, the notation, because blue going first moves to a negative 1, which is not favoring them. So blue loses by going here. Red likewise move, loses by going here because this favors blue. So this is another zero game because whoever moves first loses. Uh, using this new notation, we have these representations of positive and negative integers. And likewise, here are some representations of basic dyadic fractions. This is all just to help you get a feel of the notation that we're using so that we can actually talk about more complicated situations in a moment. Well, the moment being now. So this is our first infinite tree. Uh, since 2 thirds is not representable finitely by dyadic fractions, it requires an infinite tree, which is represented with these alternating blue and red line segments. And you can prove to yourself that this has a value of 2 thirds by tripling this tree and balancing it out with a negative 2 to equal a 0 gain. You can, I'll leave that as an exercise to you. You can try it out. It could be fun. So another interesting fact about this related to the notation is blue can chop off any one of the, the blue line segments that they want for their turn. And so the set of all their moves happens to create a sequence of dyadic fractions that approaches 2 thirds from below. And likewise, or that is the tree value once they take their turn is any of these numbers, depending on where they cut. Likewise, wherever red cuts defines uh, this sequence of possible values of the remaining tree that approaches <coughs> two thirds from above. This is always the case that the value of the tree can be defined by a sequence of dyadic fractions approaching from above and below for each player, respectively. Uh, so this is a numeric proof, if you could say. Uh, of the fact that this is two-thirds. And here's a visual representation of, uh, of that convergence. In the same way, any real number can be represented by a sequence of dyadic fractions approaching from above and below. Uh, for example, here's tangent of pi eighths, which is not a very pretty number, but it is still representable by a sequence of dyadic fractions that approach it from either side. Now, we'll switch to a different infinite tree this time, every line segment is blue. There are no reds. Obviously, this is a positive game because red doesn't even have any moves to start out with. So the red side is empty. Blue can chop off the tree arbitrarily high, meaning that all positive integers and zero are possible results of blue's move. And because of that, we know that this tree is actually greater in value than any positive integer. And so this doesn't have a name in the real numbers. We gave it, uh, Cantor, for example, gave it the name omega, the first number after all counting numbers are used. Uh, this is an infinite number and is surprisingly well behaved. You can have in, uh, omega plus 1, which is strictly greater than omega, and omega plus 2 is strictly greater than that. And you can do essentially any algebraic manipulation with this number. It's a normal number. It's just infinite. So you can also take the reciprocal of omega. So this number is called epsilon, 1 divided by omega. This is the unit infinitesimal number. Uh, as you can see, it's uh, extremely small because red has a, a pretty big advantage, but only after blue's turn. But it's obviously the, obvious that blue is going to win. 
So this is a positive number, but it's smaller than any real number. Now, let's change up the game a little bit. Let's add these green edges that either blue or red can cut. Uh, so this is a very interesting position because this, you can just tell from looking at it, this does not favor blue or red. Depending on who goes first, like if red goes first, they take this and they had the last move, so blue loses. And like the same thing in reverse for blue if they go first. So this is not in favor of either player, so this is not a positive or a negative number. But it's also not zero because zero was defined as the second person moving wins, or the first person moving loses. In this case, the first player to move wins. And so this is distinctly not zero. We give this actually the name star. Yes, we are running out of names, it'll get way worse. Don't worry. Uh, so this is a number that is confused with zero, which is a relationship that describes the fact that zero is, well, yeah, in a zero position, the second player wins, whereas in a star position, the first player wins. They inhabit essentially the same place on the number line, it's just different players win because of it. Uh, there's also star two, which is represented like this, and star three, and in general, you can have any star n number, but all of these star numbers are confused with zero and with each other. And also, any number x plus star is confused with x, or is x-ish, and yes, that's a technical term. Uh, likewise, x plus any given star number is confused with x plus any other given star number, and both are confused with x. This is a mess. Why, do, why are we making up number systems that have such like weirdness like this happen? This is obviously not ordered. So why do we care about stuff like this? This is a good time to emphasize the fact these are not quantities. This is not a quantity that we're talking about. This doesn't describe anything that happens in, in the real life, in, in like real world numbers of things. This is a value of a position in a game. So let's reframe the way that we think about numbers. Instead of quantities, these are positions. The results are very strange, and we'll get to, into even some weirder ones. So, Moving on, we have this number up. Uh, I find this number fascinating because uh, it is less than even all infinitesimal numbers, all the epsilon numbers. But it is strictly greater than zero. You can prove to yourself that blue always wins no matter who goes first. If they, they make their best moves, blue will always win this. Turns out, this number up is confused with star. Whack! Now, <laughs> There's also the negative of up, which is called down, and up plus down equals zero. Uh, and if you'd like any more details on this, you can talk to me afterwards. Uh, this new number, uh, we'll, we'll analyze right here. So this is a very strange position with a, a blue stem and infinitely many, countably infinitely many, red petals on this seeming flower. Uh, blue's only move is to cut down the whole thing, and so blue obviously wins, no matter who goes first. This is a positive number. Uh, but then, if red moves, they move to the same position that they started with. So this is actually a circularly defined number. It turns out that this number has a value that's between up and the infinitesimals, epsilon numbers. This number we, we give the name over because it's over up. Again, we are running out of names. Bear with me. Uh, its negative is called under. Uh, so, another interesting number we'll go to now. This number is called on, which is another circularly defined number. This one is greater than any number. This is similar in style and in setup to omega, as we saw before, but with all these trees, if you cut it at any given point, the value is strictly less than what it started at. But with this number, no matter what blue cuts, the value never decreases. Not, not even a bit. So this is greater than all positive numbers. This number is called on, which again is circularly defined. Maybe that bothers some of you. Let's push past that. Let's just see what weirdness we can find. So the negative is called off, appropriately. And on plus off 
obeys very similarly to what we see in normal mathematics, where you have infinity minus infinity equals undetermined. And this is given the name DUD, which stands for Deathless Universal Draw. <laughs> so awesome, because no matter how long you play this game, neither player is ever going to win. This is a draw. Uh, and DUD is also defined circular. Now, uh, we're running out of time, so we'll do a speed round of uh, some more weird numbers. Uh, we've already seen over and under. We also have up on and down on, hot, oh no, and oof, which is probably what you're feeling listening to all this. <laughs> High, low, tiny, mighty, zero and off, one and over, ace, deuce, tray, joker, club, diamond, two of hearts, three of spades. This is a mess. But I love all of this because it pushes my understanding of numbers beyond what we normally think about. If you constrain yourself to just the real numbers, it feels restricted in light of all of this, all these new numbers. Uh, again, my point here is to interest you to look into this field of combinatorial game theory yourself and explore all the weird values that come along with it. These graphics that I had in this presentation come from uh, Owen Meinsen in his fantastic video on this game of Hack and Bush. Uh, they introduced this topic with, and uh, I invite you all to look into his video if this has piqued your interest at all. And with that, I close. Thank you. sort of suggested it, and I'm sort of, surreal numbers. Yes. Um, it, it seems like this would have sort of provable correspondence to the surreals. The but surreal numbers are actually the entire set of blue-red hack and bush. So if you take out all of the, the green line segments that we introduced about halfway through, if you don't include any green line segments, the surreal numbers are represented perfectly by hack and bush with the blue and red edges. Thank you. Nice observation. So yes, the surreal numbers are a beast in and of themselves, but they are only a subset of, or a sub-collection, sub-class of this wider uh, proper class. All right, let's thank Jack Peter one more time. Apparently,